You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional F Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts, and at our website, prolevpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional F Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. No, it's not. In this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about how government works. Not things like Senate rules, some of which can be weird and specific. Like, did you know that the hold music for the telephone is available to leadership offices as an alternative to silence when callers to their office are placed on hold? The leaders, whips, assistant leaders, and conference secretaries of the U.S. Senate may select one program source from four available options. And and I guarantee you hip-hop is not one of the options. Hip-hop is not one of the options. Also, former senators are still allowed to use Senate dining rooms on a limited basis. They are also allowed to get haircuts at the Senate hair salon. The U.S. Botanical Garden has a loaning library of plants for Senate offices. But Senate offices can only borrow three at a time, and they can only get six during the course of an entire year. If your senator is a plant, like uh, Chuck Grassley. (laughs) Don't, 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 don't. No, no, that's wrong. (laughs) See, I went went there. I went just a little bit too far there, but yes. Well, but if your okay. senator is a house plant, that doesn't count no, because the botanical her. garden knows nothing about that. I see. I see. And the, and the, and the voters have chosen you. So you mean blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now, on the other hand, some Senate rules can actually alter the course of history. Mm-hmm. For example, Senate Rule 22 is the rule which allows the Senate to invoke cloture and limit debate only after a two thirds majority vote, which is why you'll hear idiots and pundits all over the Internet and all over TV over and over again repeating you know, you got to have pretty much everything in the Senate has to have a 60 vote uh, threshold to pass. Got to have 60 votes. This is not true. A two thirds vote is only required to overcome a filibuster, which is also a made up Senate thing, which has been made infinitely worse by another made up Senate thing. Rather than actually taking the floor and refusing to give it up as long as you're talking, which is the old filibuster, the new streamlined filibuster rule only requires that a Senate a senator signal that he or she is filibustering and everything else grinds to a halt. This is how Republicans crippled the Obama administration once Scott Brown won a special election in Massachusetts to become the, quote, 41st vote to repeal Obamacare and kill everything else Obama proposed. It's also the, quote, unquote, rule that Mitch McConnell got rid of in 2017 to pave the way for Trump to appoint three Federalist Society crackpots to the Supreme Court and destroy the court for a generation. And then there is the blue slip ritual, which was designed to force the White House to consult the senators from the home state of any federal judge they plan to nominate. And with only three exceptions, for a century, no federal judges were nominated and confirmed without a blue slip approval of their home state senators. The 105 judgeships that were left open by Obama that Trump said was because Obama had gotten complacent, those vacancies existed because Republican senators refused to blue slip any nominee from their home states. And the most vocal defender of the blue slip ritual had been Chuck Grassley, right up until Trump was elected, at which point Grassley got rid of the blue slip tradition, and the GOP began nominating and appointing crackpots, bigots, and hacks to the federal court for life. So we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> we're not, <laughs> not going to talk about the Byzantine rules of the Senate or the rituals of reconciliation or why the Illinois legislature has a separate veto session or why Chicago has 50 aldermen instead of 10, which would make more sense, and how that makes a joke out of the strong council, weak mayor system. Any of the things that elected human beings do to enact laws and regulations, we're not talking about that. 
or the simplified version of how government works thanks to Schoolhouse Rock. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Instead, we're going to invite you into the secret world of what happens after those laws and regulations are passed. In some cases, it's pretty straightforward. On January 1st, 1980, the drinking age in the state of Illinois went from 19 to 21. The appropriate statutes were amended, and that's all it took. Yay, Schoolhouse Rocks! Boo, boo. I was I was 19 on at the end of October, yeah, 1979. So <laughs> I had two months, and then they took it all away from me. On the other hand, as of January 1st, 2020, recreational consumption, possession, and sales of cannabis products have been legal in the state of Illinois. That's right. We've got legal weed, folks. Overall, that process went fairly smoothly. But there have been complications because pot is still illegal at the federal level. Mm -hmm. So marijuana dispensaries can sell marijuana in Illinois, but banks protected by the FDIC and regulated by the federal government cannot accept deposits from marijuana dispensaries, nor can banks process credit card payments to dispensaries. Banks also cannot provide small business loans to dispensaries. And they would love to have that interest money flowing through their coffers. Yes, they would. Perhaps most importantly, the Internal Revenue Service views any source of income as taxable, including income from the sale of marijuana. This means dispensaries need to pay federal income tax on sales and file an annual return with the IRS. But they cannot claim deductions for business expenses related to marijuana sales. All of this is why Chuck Schumer is a big pot legalization guy. Mm -hmm. His bill is a bank and tax bill, not a pot bill. And his primary uh, constituents in this whole situation are the banks. Mm -hmm. Now, one day we'll have to get uh, our son Junior dude in here to do an entire hour and a half on pot legalization across the country. But not today. Not today. That I'll tune in for that show because Junior Dude knows all <laughs> there will, is to know will, about that. He will tell you the history. But, yes. But today we're going to take a short tour of the literal machinery of government. Because anytime the government requires the collection of money and or citizen data or that tax money be spent in a specific way or that performance information about the expenditure of that money meets certain requirements, which are measured and audited, all of that can be insanely complicated. Because then you're talking about fiddling with computer software. And usually you're talking about old, cranky computer software. Old, cranky computer software. And Mm -hmm. if you're an elected chief executive, and let's say you've run on a platform of running government like a business. Or if you're in Alabama, running government like a Waffle House. Yeah, yeah. And you come from a world where you snap your fingers and stuff gets done. But you don't understand how the literal machinery of government bureaucracy works, and none of your people understand it, you can end up becoming very, very, um, I guess the word is frustrated. Yeah. You can also look like an idiot. Yeah. You get those get those government blue balls from that. You get those government, because <laughs> you're all pent up. You got important things you want to do, and people are telling you, no, 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 no. Or to quote James Tiberius Kirk, you have to learn why things work on a starship. It's really kind of important. So today, we're going to tell you two true short stories about what actually happens when someone way up the food chain decides that things must change. Now, once upon a time, because all good stories must begin once upon a time, I worked for the city of Chicago as a senior executive in the Workforce Development Department. This is a department that no no longer exists, so don't bother looking for it on any map. It's like Brigadoon. It's gone. Chicago, if you didn't know this, is the third largest city in the United States and is very much larger than the uh, second largest city in Illinois. It is the largest city in Illinois by a long shot. It's more than 20 times larger than the state capital of Springfield, which leads to a lot of tension because although Chicago gets the lion's share of most of the federal funding for most things, since Springfield's the seat of state government, pretty much all federal funding that comes to Chicago must first pass through Springfield and all the statewide systems who administer those funds are under the control of Springfield. I assume I, this is a lot like Albany in New York City or 
you know, Los Angeles, California or Miami, Florida, or these other places where the state capital is a Just, small town compared yeah. to the big city in the state. In my experience going to conferences mm -hmm. um, and dealing with people from Albany and people from New York City, um, uh, the people from Albany were much less had, had much more of the wind taken out of their sails by New York City than Springfield did. Oh, they were just okay. sad because New York <laughs> City has has all the money. Uh -huh, and th uh -huh. they would just tell the state government, screw you. We're not doing it your way. We're doing it our way. We'll see you in court. And that's the way they dealt with their state government, which, you know, in some cases is, is pretty effective. Uh, but in Illinois, it's a little bit different. Um, there is a, an attempted partnership. Remember that state government has shifted back and forth between Democrats and Republicans for, you know, 70 years. Um, and I was there the day that this arrangement hit the fan. Um, so quickly, there's stuff you need to know about Illinois. First of all, Illinois has 102 counties, but currently only 25 full-service workforce centers. This is because, for the most part, the state's Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity will bundle several less populated counties together into what's called a local workforce area. And each area has one main workforce center, except for Chicago. <laughs> which, when I was there, needed 10 workforce centers, yeah. the main ones, the big ones, where everything gets done. And we had like 30 or 40 affiliated centers to service the entire city. And that is what Springfield could not stand. So when I but started- that was just purely that was just purely based on- Population. Population. I mean, you know, the number of people that need services in Effingham compared to Chicago is minuscule. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, Chicago has 50 aldermen. Uh -huh. And those 50 aldermen, some of them have, you know, populations just in their ward. They're larger than counties in Illinois. Right. Multiple right. counties in Illinois. So, and aldermen are all princes. They all think they own everything and they should. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. all the aldermen want a police station, a fire station, and a workforce center in their ward. A workforce center wards. right in their, in their, wards. In their and, ward. Right. And there was never enough money to do that. But we had like 10 of them distributed all over the city that were geographically, you know, kind of dispersed. And then we had 30 or 40 affiliates, which are organizations where we partner with other agencies like homelessness and uh, children and family services and so forth to do a, a center where our services along with other people's are offered. Okay. Same, same case management system. But we had a whole bunch of offices all over the city where most the rest of the state had one per like four counties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, when I started working at the city, which was in the early 2000s, it was not in the 1840s. It was not very long ago. The internet was up and running. The statewide workforce system was a DOS based system that ran on a wide area network and not on the internet. And each local area was allotted one count them one network connection. That's it. <laughs> Period. So I'm this, not laughing at you, Dr. Class. I know. I'm just I know. trying to imagine this house with one network. Yeah. <laughs> with one yeah. network system in it. You know, you know, you have one, one, one place you plug in, right? That's it. One phone and everyone's got a waiting line to use it. And, <laughs> and that's, you know, and, and being from the real world, I sized up this problem immediately when I was hired. Yeah. Um, so each local area is allotted one connection and on a system that had been developed a long time ago by a Springfield-based software company, and it was administered by Springfield-based state employees who planned to be uh, retiring to that software company once they left the state. So as you can imagine, it was a very cozy relationship, and it was perfectly adequate if you were, say, local workforce area four, which encompasses eight counties, but had only one main workforce center where all business was conducted. Okay, but this was a complete disaster for Chicago. It meant that hundreds of case managers who worked for us that served tens of thousands of clients all over the city had no access to an antiquated DOS-based case management system, which they should have been using and had no access to. Instead, and remember, this is all happening in the early 2000s. The internet had been around for a minute. Case managers had to fill out paper forms every time they interacted with a client and then ship the forms once a week off to the offices where I worked, where we had a dozen, believe it or not, data entry clerks who would enter the data like it was 1975 into a case management system that none yeah. of the case managers could use. So they All had to the share a terminal, uh -huh. type in manually mm -hmm. my name and address. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. 
And of course, this caused huge lag times because you're filling out forms and you're sending them down and they're typed to the thing and then they run the thing. And it took, you know, a, a hell of a long time for the data to catch up. And then there'd be problems. Big and small problems, as as in every human enterprise. So there's missing addresses. You know what? In Chicago, there's no East Ashland Avenue. Um, or you get duplicate people. You get John Smith, who went into two different workforce centers and applied to different things. And you never know that until the case managers filled out the paperwork and it was entered by the file clerk and entered by the data clerk. And boom, wait a minute. John Smith is in two different places at once. That can't be right. Then you have to go through the whole process in reverse and then redo all the paperwork which caused even more lag times. And it was impossible for my department to get a real-time snapshot of how our system was doing. The snapshot was always weeks or months out of date. And worse yet, we couldn't administer any of the other programs we were running through the state's crappy system. This is Chicago. We were running like six different workforce grants at once. And we couldn't run the other five through this crappy system because the crappy system wouldn't accommodate them. So you you had grants that won't talk to each other. Again, John Smith is in one system and another, and you have no way of knowing that. Now, Springfield was always quick to spank us on our audits for all of these lags and all these mistakes. Then they give us this, well, that's just too goddamn bad smirk when we protested that it was their system that was causing the problem. So I was hired and I saw what needed to be done and that precipitated a bitter, acrimonious 18-month war with the state, which, to quote the hunt for Red October, was a war with no battles, no monuments, only bureaucratic casualties. <laughs> now, there were plenty of perfectly viable web-based software packages available at that time, which could be easily customized to meet the needs of Chicago and would also benefit the rest of the state. Everyone would find this thing a freaking miracle. It would be terrific. Springfield would not hear of it. And when we finally bullied them, because we're big and we have a lot of money and a lot of clout, into opening up the bidding for a new system, they wrote the specifications in such a way that no company, except the company they already did business with in Springfield, could possibly qualify for the grant, which is insane. I got calls from reputable software companies all over the country with products on the market ready to go asking me if they should even bother to bid because it was clear mm -hmm. this this shit was rigged uh but they screwed up it turned out the state had written the proposal so restrictively that they also had accidentally made it impossible for their own pet software company to bid on it so nobody could bid on it so they redrafted the proposal <laughs> and i found out because honey i had eyes everywhere at the time oh i bet you did um that they were including literal screenshots of the shitty old system in the proposal and insisting that any new system had to look and act exactly like the old crappy system. It has to look like Blogger, yes. 1994, or I won't use it. That's right. It has to look <laughs> like Space Invaders, or I'm not going to play. Um <laughs> Now, this made them look like idiots, and I made sure everybody knew it. So I was no friend. You are not popular. I, I, I was sick of it. I was sick of it. Um, yeah. And in the yeah. end, they just rigged the bid. Well, just yeah, because they couldn't get around you. So no. so the, the final bids came in, and we had gone through a very, very exhaustive selection process. They'd agreed to some company that we found marginally acceptable. Our bid came in at whatever it was, and their bid came in at whatever ours was, minus $50. Wow. They clearly rigged the bid. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that critical elements of the workforce system of the entire state of Illinois were held hostage for nearly mm -hmm. two years by a handful of aging IT guys on Monroe Avenue in Springfield because the idea of changing from their shitty, home-brewed, nearly useless DOS-based software system to an easy-to-use, battle-tested web-based system threatened to interfere with their goddamn retirement plans. Not that Drift Glass holds any grudges whatsoever. No, no, no. <laughs> but I, I can't say that that didn't contribute to my long-term, um, short-termness at the city. Yeah. I'm sure I made more yeah. enemies than I'm I made I'm sure friend. they did not like you after yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and, and also because the whole process was being pushed along by Chicago, and they hated Chicago. Mm -hmm. I mean, they arranged for our audits to be done in November. Every year so they can come up and shop on Michigan Avenue and spend a week yeah, up here and right. shopping. So they appreciated right. the fact that there were nice things up here, but they really hated us. And, mm -hmm. and now I live here. And, and, and so I got that going for me. 
And that, boys and girls, is why a lot of things that happen in the government beyond the public view happen the way they do. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a story about aging tech in government. So how widespread are aging tech problems in government? From Politico, April 18th, 2018, quote, IRS systems crash came after years of warnings to Congress. The IRS computer system meltdown that halted the processing of millions of returns came after years of warnings from top IRS officials, federal auditors, and tax professionals that the agency's IT system is outdated and needs much more than patchwork repairs. Mm -hmm. Defenders of the agency say it is suffering from more than a decade of budget cuts pushed by Republicans who have an ideological aversion to the agency, especially after a, now this is pure Politico, a controversy over IRS scrutiny of conservative nonprofits exploded in 2013. That wasn't it at all. That was Conservatives the- exploded because their nonprofits were examined by the IRS and liberal nonprofits were examined as well. Yeah. And uh, that was not a controversy. That, that was, was a ginned up controversy. That was the Tea Party. And the explosion the was that you had dozens and dozens of these organizations popping up with like, I hate paying taxes. I'm not going to pay my taxes. Screw you. I'm supporting Republicans because taxes are evil. And the IRS said, well, could you maybe explain what you're doing and what your status is? And the answer was no. No, yeah. I'm, I'm about freedom. And then they went and cried in front of Paul Ryan. One lady right. went and cried in front of Paul Ryan. And that was that. Uh, okay, so this is from the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Five years later, February 15th, 2023, this year, quote, how long does it take to get a payment from the government? Tax refunds, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid claims, and much more are processed through federal IT systems, but many of these systems are decades old and outdated, which can slow down federal payments and services and make taxpayer information vulnerable to cyber attacks. Congress has long recognized aging IT systems as a costly vulnerability for the federal government and has appropriated funding to update systems. But many of these efforts face delays and setbacks. The IRS uses hundreds of application software and hardware systems that are outdated, 25 years or older, or written in a programming language that is no longer used. Among these, one example stands out. The primary system that the IRS uses to process individual taxpayer account data. This critical system helps IRS assess taxes, generate refunds, update accounts, and more. It was built in the late 1960s. It is almost as old as I am, Drift Glass. Oh, my gosh. It was built around the same time NASA's Apollo missions were first sending astronauts to the moon. The system has been updated over the years, but maintaining it is getting harder because it relies on a computer programming language, COBOL, that fewer and fewer programmers know, unquote. Now, just for the record, I speak fluent COBOL and Assembler and JCL. So I, I'm, not, I'm not talking out of my ass when I say that COBOL is an awesome language. This is from the Washington Post, February 24th, 2023. Quote, IRS tech is so archaic, the agency struggles to find people to work it. The Internal Revenue Service, which funds nearly everything the federal government does, uses information technology that is creaking with old age, as some of us are. Some of its computer systems are so antiquated, a federal watchdog complains that it's difficult to find people who know how to work them, unquote. And this is a headline from the Stack Overflow blog from April of 2020, quote, Is COBOL a dead language now? No, COBOL is not a dead language. While there may not have been enough COBOL programmers to fix New Jersey's unemployment system... The language still runs the world's economy, unquote. Now, my wife made me take out a whole bunch of nerd stuff and tech stuff. I did. I deleted a whole bunch of nerd stuff about COBOL from the script. I wanted to verbally compare the JavaScript language to COBOL to show you how wonderful it is. But she won't let me, so fine. (laughs) (laughs) But that does bring us, at last, uh, to the story of Grace Murray Hopper versus the Terminator. Now, Admiral Grace Hopper who was awesome, was involved in the creation of UNIVAC, which was the first all-electric digital computer. She invented the first computer compiler, which is a program that translates written instructions into codes that computers read directly. 
This work led her to co-develop the COBOL programming language in 1959 during the Eisenhower administration. Keep that in mind. So by the 1970s, there were literally billions of lines of COBOL code out there in the world, just grinding along, doing whatever they were doing at insurance companies, banks, hospitals, airports, and government agencies. But for a variety of reasons, COBOL had began... Pop, pop, pop. But for a variety of reasons, COBOL began to gradually fall out of favor at colleges and universities. In 1975, a well-respected Dutch computer scientist famously declared, quote, the use of COBOL cripples the mind. Its <laughs> teaching should therefore be regarded as a criminal offense, uh-huh. unquote. Plus, there were cooler, newer, and more versatile programming languages showing up every day. Languages that could be used to program PCs and Macs, build web-based applications, and eventually smartphone apps. And that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. And so, as older COBOL programmers began to retire or change careers, it's nice you didn't write die in here, Uh, Driftleth. You know, but they did. Uh, the supply of new COBOL programmers began to drop off sharply. As a brief aside, the Y2K problem was not a nothing. It was Mm -hmm. solved by hundreds of COBOL programmers working their asses off around the clock to fix it. Mm -hmm. That's why nothing blew up. It's it's the train that didn't crash. It's the plane that didn't explode. Um, But the billions of lines of code that were running systems all over the world were unaware of these changes. They just kept right on doing what they were doing until 49 years after COBOL was invented, it came face to face with the governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. This was 2008. This is during the before time. This is before Trump, before Barack Obama was elected, back when you might tune in Face the Nation on a Sunday morning and find Bob Schieffer asking California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger the following, quote, Rush Limbaugh might say that all you've done is gone liberal, unquote. And Arnold would reply that it's all about centrism and compromise because it's about just serving the people, not the party and so forth. And now we work together. We get burnt to ideas together and all of those things. (laughs) We give bird together. Bird bird to the ideas together. (laughs) And then Arnold would exit the stage and up next would be rising presidential candidate, John Edwards. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Yeah, that, That was 2008, kids. Remember yeah. it well. So it's 2008, and Arnold is governor, and he is, by God, going to balance the state of California's budget, whatever it takes. And what was his genius plan? Well, we found out what his genius plan was in the California Press Democrat from July 31st of 2008. Quote, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed an executive order Thursday, eliminating jobs for an estimated 10,300 temporary state employees and reducing pay for about 200,000 state workers to the federal minimum wage of $6.55 per hour, portraying it as a stopgap measure to ensure the state can pay its bills without a state budget. State employees will receive their full back pay once a budget is signed, Schwarzenegger said. The Republican governor's order also imposes a strict hiring freeze and eliminates overtime, but exempts workers in health and safety fields, unquote. Aha. This sounds very familiar to to me as a resident of Illinois, I yeah. have to say. Oh yeah. No, it was it was this, this is, is during, Rauner this is Rauner's blueprint. This is the Great Recession. This is, you know, yeah. oh, budgets yeah. were dropping That's everywhere. True. Shortly after yep. this, I was laid off from the city of Chicago. So mm-hmm. it's right around that time frame. But um that's when an ancient and terrible weapon called COBOL was activated. This is from IT News, August seventh, two thousand eight. Quote Schwarzenegger pay plans thwarted by COBOL. Way to go, COBOL. 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 California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's plans to reduce all state employees' pay for the minimum wage are being blocked because the payroll system is run on COBOL. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is just this makes me smile all over. State Controller John Chang told the Senate Committee on Governmental Organization that this was impossible as the payroll system was written 30 years ago in COBOL and there weren't enough programmers to do the job. Chang estimated that the current resources it would take, uh, I'm sorry, that that, pop, pop, pop. Chang estimated that with current resources, it would take six months to make the change and then nine to 10 months to reverse them. Pragmatically, we just can't get the system to work in a timely manner for us to implement 
payment of minimum wage, Chang said, according to the Sacramento Bee, unquote. The story goes on for several more years with Schwarzenegger continuing to order the state controller to do things that the controller refuses to do and trying various ways to slash the workforce and violate the contracts of various unions that eventually land Schwarzenegger in court. Mm -hmm. But the moral of the story is where we'll end things today. Schwarzenegger came from a world where he was used to snapping his fingers and having things done immediately. But mostly the government at all levels just doesn't work that way. That's not good or bad. It's just the way things are. Mm -hmm. Instead, a tiny handful of old IT guys can jam up the gears of government almost indefinitely if they want to. Or conversely, the absence of a handful of IT veterans who might have just been laid off in 2008 by yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Or maybe we're still around but feeling a little spicy because their governor had told them he was going to slash their pay to minimum wage. All of that can just bring the Terminator to his knees. Yeah. The I end. am reminded of a friend of mine, Drift Lass, who bought uh -huh. a house on North 6th Street here in Springfield. And she went, her, her address was North 6th Street. And she went to the um, Sangamon County... Uh, Department of Deeds or whatever, the Registrar's Office for Land, mm -hmm. because she had to apply for the homestead exemption for, you know, county taxes, right? She had to do all this paperwork. And she went in and she had all her paperwork and she had the mortgage papers and everything. And she went in and, and she said, you know, I want to do this. And they looked at it and they looked at their computer and they looked at it and they looked at their computer and they said, you can't live at this place because we don't have North 6th Street in our computer system. So this can't be your address. You don't exist. And she said, I just bought the house there. And that is my, I'm getting my electric bill there. So I know that I'm living there. Uh huh. And someone said, you know what? You should ask Margaret. <laughs> and they went back and asked Margaret. And Margaret said, oh yeah, the computer thinks that North 6th Street is 6th Street. Uh -huh. there, in the computer, there's a South 6th Street. Uh -huh. But there's no North 6th Street. There's just a 6th Street. So you have, because South 6th was added on later. Because that's how magnetic you, poles work in Springfield. In 1963, there was just one 6th Street, and then they added on and they made that yeah. South 6th. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really was like a 1969, 1971 situation. And the institutional knowledge of what that was was with Margaret. Yeah. Yep. What happens when Margaret retires? Oh, it, they, I, I tell you. They're not going to upgrade the system. No. They're, they've been depending on Margaret for 15, 20 years to know that, right? And I guarantee you, I mean, I, I if we had another 17 hours on this podcast, I could bore <laughs> you with. There, there's the guy in Chicago who was, they laid him off and suddenly like a week or two later, like CTA buses Everything was sort of going wrong with the transit system. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy in a, in a garage somewhere or, or office somewhere in sub, some sub-basement whose job it was, was like to take the information from this area and put it in that thing. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was what he did. And no one knew what he did. And he'd been there a million years. And they just thought, yeah, well, you know, his job can't be that important. So we're, we're cutting back. So we'll get rid of Philip. And they got rid of Philip. And two weeks later, everything falls apart. Because what Philip was doing is actually like sneaker wearing, which is what we would call um, a network that's basically a person carrying something from A to B. Right. Uh, was was what's holding the system together. And yeah. up where all the computers are brand new and everything's shiny and everyone had uh, at the time a, um, uh, a Palm Pilot because that was a sign of status. They didn't know how to use them. They, they were colorful and they were status symbols. Up at that level, they just think it's all freaking magic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all, if, if you just yell at the magicians hard enough, they'll just do the magic and things will work. Mm -hmm. And my job, 80% of the time was explaining in very small words, it's not freaking magic. It will require money. It requires manpower. And the systems we're dealing with are very, very old. It, you're walking into a, a house made of old dynamite and oily rags, flicking matches every which way. And you don't know what you're going to blow up. So please, please, please. Take your time and be careful and figure out how the damn thing works before you decide you know how to how to change it or scrap it. 
And there are dozens of stories like that. But mm-hmm. that's how government really works. Because at some point, somebody had to, to build a freaking database to do a thing. And right. they piled more stuff on it, more stuff on it, more stuff on it. And suddenly, it's no longer the Kennedy administration. It's the Clinton administration. Right. And all that stuff is under there still doing what it does. And no one knows how it works or why. And no one can figure out how to fix it. This, I believe, is the plot of Space Cowboys. So Yeah. Yeah. Let's... Well, and, it, and it's like the Springfield public school system when they could no longer use number of students getting free lunches in order to get grant money Mm -hmm. because the agriculture department told them, no, you can't do that. They just started giving everybody free lunches because there was no point. They did. They didn't need to collect any data anymore. It's too expensive Mm -hmm. to keep separating out one lunch over another. Mm -hmm. They were only doing it to get grant money. And so fine, we're just going to open up the cafeteria, <laughs> which yeah. which every state should do anyway. I mean, yeah. lunches should be free. Breakfast well, and lunch should be free. Well, when, school, you, when but... all you show up in Springfield and buy me a beer, I will tell you all <laughs> about these horror stories with names and dates attached and consequences attached. But for today, that's the end of our No Fair Remembering Stuff podcast. Do you, and you want to talk about a, a potential game show? Is that right, Blue Gal? Oh, I just want to... Let everybody know we are thinking about doing a little quiz show with some uh, podcast and uh, old school blogger luminaries uh, just to do some no fair remembering stuff to get to see how much old school bloggers remember. Yeah. I think and, it'll be fun. We'll, we're like going to try it. Like the original quiz show, we're, we're, we're accepting bribes. So <laughs> No, we're not. It, no, we're not. But we are always looking for more Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so. You can do it at patreon.com, proleftpod, or paypal.me slash proleftpodcast. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you all next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.